Okay. Welcome, everybody. I think that uh, there's still some people connecting, uh, but uh, we can indeed uh, start already. Uh, we had uh, quite a few uh, people who uh, were uh, confirming their participation, and I see that the number is still going up. But uh, in the interest of time, I will already uh, start with a, a short introduction. Uh, welcome on behalf of ECDPM to all of you. Um, and let me just uh, briefly explain a bit what the purpose is of this event. Uh, why did we uh, take this initiative? In recent years, we have seen that there was a lot of talk about a so-called partnership of equals, uh, a rhetoric that came back in a whole range of uh, strategy documents uh, of the European Union, uh, the March 2020 Comprehensive Strategy with Africa, uh, we also see this uh, wording appearing in earlier strategies, like the Joint Africa-Europe strategy of 2007. Um, it is also coming back to some extent in the recently negotiated new ACP-EU deal, uh, which uh, was initialed in April of this year. Um, so it's clearly something that uh, comes back a lot in all types of uh, policy declarations. And the question, of course, that we want to put today to our panel is, are we moving in the right direction towards a partnership of equals? Or is this just a slogan? Uh, is this more and more becoming reality? Or will it just remain a hollow uh, word? And so we will uh, explore this today with uh, a, a panel of uh, uh, mainly independent thinkers. Some of the panelists uh, that I will present to you in a minute are former officials, and we deliberately selected a number of former officials because they have the freedom of speech. They can speak very openly on a whole range of uh, uh, issues related to the partnership uh, between Europe and Africa. They can also point to certain ambiguities, to certain asymmetries, but what we also hope from all of the panelists is that they come forward with uh, prospective proposals with nice ideas uh, that could be uh, helping us in building this uh, more equal partnership. Let me present uh, the panelists to, to you. And then I just explain in two words how we will uh, organize uh, the panel itself. Uh, the first speaker will be Sai Jinit, many of you uh, probably no Said. He's an Algerian diplomat with a long standing career. He's a former commissioner for peace and security at the African Union Commission. He was a former special envoy of the United Nations Secretary General for the Great Lakes. And he also has been the head of the United Nations Office for West Africa. So Said has been playing a key role in African Union, Europe Union, in Africa-Europe relations. And he's now still very active. He is a senior advisor at ACORT, and he's also the president of the Advisory Council of the Institute for Security Studies, uh, which most of you know, institute based in uh, South Africa with uh, branches all over uh, Africa. And then our second speaker today will be Marc Franco. He's a Belgian uh, national. He's a former European Commission official. He was the Deputy Director General of Europe Aid, which you could call the predecessor of DEFCO and currently EFA. And uh, uh, he also has been an ambassador of the European Union to Egypt and Russia. So he can bring in also perspectives beyond the Euro Africa partnership. Um, third speaker. And I hear that there is some noise. Maybe some people should turn off their mics. Yes, thank you. Um, the third speaker will be Tanya Cox. Uh, Tanya is British and maybe also now partly Belgian. Uh, she can explain this to you after Brexit. But she's the director of Concord, uh, the European Confederation of Development NGOs, which most of you also know very well. And in the past, she has been playing leading roles in Plan International, in Chil uh, Save the Children and in uh, Human Rights uh, Watch. Uh, she has and is still playing a lead role in helping to design the strategic direction of the NGO community in the uh, European Union. And as a fourth speaker, we have Sheikh Tidian Die. He's a Senegalese national. He's a director of ENDA CASIT, the African Center for Trade, Integration and Development. 
based in uh, Dakar in Senegal. And Sheikh has a very long standing expertise on international trade negotiations, uh, including the sometimes controversial economic partnership agreements. He knows all about this uh, and he knows very well where these EPAs, uh, to some extent, have been uh, playing a role in building stronger or maybe weaker partnerships between the European Union and uh, Africa. And then finally, I also have the pleasure to present my colleague, Lidet Tadesse. Lidet is an uh, Ethiopian national. She's a, Ethiopia, an, a Europe Africa analyst, and she has been doing a lot of work uh, in ECDPM and beyond ECDPM because she also has been working for a while in the African Union, but she uh, has been uh, and is mainly working uh, on security and resilience issues, uh, specialized in African European and multilateral approaches to peace building uh, in Africa. So with this panel, I think we can have a very exciting debate and we have split up the one and a half hour session in two rounds. And the first round is a kind of a retrospective type of round. And we will look at many years of Europe-Africa relations. Did we make progress? Uh, what lessons did we learn from the different frameworks? That's the first round. And after that first round, where each of the five panelists will have three to five minutes to put forward some uh, findings and some experiences, we will have a first round of questions and answers from the audience. And then we will have a second round a second round that will be much more prospective, forward-looking, trying to make proposals for a more equal interest-driven partnership in the coming years, in the years ahead. Uh, so this is the plan. And let's now start with the first round. We have asked each of the five panelists to use three to maximum five minutes to spell out their own experiences in the past 20 years with the different Africa-Europe partnership agreements has there been any substantial progress from their perspective in moving towards a more equal and interest-driven partnership? If not, why did we not, not make any more progress? And then the question that we also put to them was, is it possible to compare ACP, EU and African Union, European Union continent to continent frameworks and the way these have contributed or did not contribute to a more interest-driven partnership of equals. So we want to learn some lessons of experience. Let's start with Said. Said, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Gert. Uh, well, how can I start this business? I would say the following. In the late 80s, I was involved in the follow-up of the cooperation agreement between my country, Algeria, and the European community. This agreement was part of the specific partnership that the European community was having with the individual North African countries. In this context, we were having consultative meetings with our colleagues from the North African embassies in Brussels uh, on, regional, on the regional dimension of our agreements with the European uh, co community. However, I realized that there was a parallel cooperation framework bringing together the European community, other sub-Saharan African countries, and countries from the Caribbean and the Pacific. Having served earlier in our embassy in Addis Ababa, working with the Organization of African Unity, where the unity of the continent is essential, albeit challenging, I could not understand the rationale of dividing Africa into two groups. I could not understand either what brought the African sub-Saharan countries closer to the countries of the Caribbean and the Pacific than to the North African countries. When I joined the OAU from Brussels, I went to the OAU as chef de cabinet in 1989, coming from Brussels where I observed and admired the European model of consolidation of peace through economic integration, I was deeply involved in the promotion of the relations between the OAU, later on the AU, and the European Union. I am a witness of the exponential evolution of the relations between the two organizations between the early 90s and 2008, when I left the African Union. This period was marked by the adoption, among others, 
of the African Peace Facility 2003-2004, the Lisbon Africa EU Summit and its landmark Joint Africa EU Strategy in 2007, and the first Commission to Commission meeting. During that period, I personally believe that there was a real effort to move forward towards an equal and interest-driven partnership. I remember that the first and second Africa EU summits outcomes were fairly negotiated and reflected to some extent the concerns and interests of both sides. This being said, the fact that the African countries were expected uh, to benefit from financial and technical assistance from the European Union through its various programs, it was difficult to reach a partnership between equals. There is an African proverb which says, the hand that gives is always above the hands that receives. Over the past years, however, I had the impression that that, that term, determination to build the partnership of equals was somehow eroding. The pressure exerted by the European Union on the African countries for signing the regional economic partnership agreements to overcome the, the reservation and reluctance of some countries was an indication of that impression. I felt that the European Union was exploiting the weaknesses and the internal divisions within the continent to pursue its objective. The post cotonou negotiations was, in my view, a missed opportunity to move towards a more audacious and modern agreement between the two continents and their continental institutions. I thought that the two sides could have seized the opportunity to engage in an exit strategy from the Cotonou Agreement, which was based on a vision which was obsolete and which was not consistent with the vision between the EU and the European Union, as reflected in the Lisbon Joint Strategy. They could have adopted a post Cotonou transitional arrangement and engage, frankly, in a binding continent to continent strategy, uh, strategic relation. The post Cotonou arrangement, which was finally agreed, may prove difficult to reconcile with the continent-to-continent -continent approach despite some language precaution in the agreement. In fact, the new agreement will probably engender a superposition of meetings with the African region of the ACP, then with the North African countries, and then with the three regions of the ACP, and then finally with all African countries within the framework of the AU. This could be seen as an indication of the reluctance to adopt a continent-to-continent -continent approach. I used to tease my partners uh, when I was in Brussels. I used to tease my partners, friends, by saying that you like Africa, but in slices. Such an approach, in addition, such an approach is not, may not be consistent with the stated objective of the European Union to support continental integration. Finally, the decision of the European Union to terminate the African Peace Facility, which was established at the request of the Second African Union Summit in 2003, and to put in place an European Peace Facility, could be also seen as deviance from the research of a more balanced relation with Africa. But also... So that, that's, uh, I, maybe I could, uh, yeah, maybe I, I would say. I, I think that's very point. fine, uh, Said, for as an opener. That's very yeah, that's fine. Okay. It, yeah, that's it, okay. it brings a, a provocative perspective from your own background uh, on uh, the way Europe-Africa relations uh, have been handled, uh, past and, and, and present. Let's maybe now ask uh, Mark, Mark Franco, what his uh, experience has been in uh, this Europe-Africa partnership. Of course, Mark has been out of the Europe Africa business for quite some time, but he has seen uh, the evolution of this partnership and he's at this moment uh, still a, a fellow of Egmont, still following uh, closely Europe Africa relations. Please, Mark, floor is yours. Okay, you, you can hear me? Okay. Um, well, I am um, uh, indeed a former official and diplomat of European institutions. 
uh, and I am afraid, that, and of course, I still have many friends and former colleagues there, and perhaps with what I'm going to say, I'm going to make uh, uh, many enemies uh, because I'm going to be fairly critical. Now, in fact, the being critical has been more made easier by the, the, the previous speaker because I, by and large, agree with what he has said. Um, and uh, so the first point I want to make is I want to speak about Africa. And uh, I think that even uh, ECDPM here has a little bit of a blind spot, because when I see the documents, the important documents that you quote uh, over the last uh, over the last years uh, on Africa relationship, uh, you miss the very important one of February uh, 21 on Southern Neighborhood. Uh, the Southern Neighborhood, North Africa, is part of Africa. And uh, the important paper there is, in fact, the paper that has been uh, launched, the Comprehensive Africa, or, okay, there have been many before, but the, le the recent one is March 2020, the Comprehensive EU Strategy with Africa. And that, I think, uh, gives, uh, and we'll come back in the second part, uh, the, the, the guidance for where we have to go in the, in the future. Because if you look at the past, um, the uh, relationship that European Union has been built up with parts of the world is a, a kind of, a, I would say, result of history. Uh, we started uh, with uh, the, a number of countries that were colonists in 58, that became the Yaoundé Convention in the 60s, uh, with a, in a very, I would say, colonial, neo-colonial spirit. Then comes the uh, Lomé Convention, and the Lomé Convention is really an innovation uh, because it puts into place a kind of a north-south relationship, a new international economic order uh, at a European scale. Uh, it has been uh, uh, eroded since. It has been um, uh, emptied from its context. Context, the, uh, the content uh, as far as aid and, and, and trade is, is, is concerned. Uh, the institutional setup has been left over. Uh, I'm not so sure uh, what the use is of the remaining institutions from the ACP uh, uh, cooperation times, because in fact, as far as trade is concerned and as far as aid is concerned, it has all been put under the general uh, kind of uh, approach of the European Union. Now, the, the same goes for the Mediterranean. Uh, we have been struggling in the in the 70s and 80s uh, to build up a kind of a Mediterranean policy. The great breakthrough comes in 95 with the um, uh, with the, uh, the the Barcelona pro the Barcelona Declaration. Now. As the uh, uh, as well as the uh, I mean as the the Lomé Convention is an innovative framework, also the Mediterranean uh, Agreement, the Barcelona Agreement, is an innovative framework. So we sit there with two frameworks that really open a, a, a whole field of cooperation of European Union with two parts of the world. I mean, historically they have been split uh, in the approach of the European Union. Um, that are, in my view, not so bad. I mean, it provides a framework in which you can work. Now, what goes wrong? I think what goes wrong is that on neither side, neither on the side of the European Union, nor on the side of the partner countries, we have been able to really uh, implement this and to use this in the right way. Uh, I would say that the, the problems with the bad, uh, uh, say, or the not so good results, or the disappointing results of the Lomi Convention is not so much the convention itself as the way it has been interpreted and applied by the uh, European Union officials and the way it has been also applied by the partnership gov the partner governments that have not really uh, taken uh, full uh, benefit in fact uh, of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the 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 facilities that has been offered uh, the second point I want to make, and I will come back also to that later, is that uh, we, we should have not two be... minutes, very oh, short, two yeah, minutes. I, we should not be, I mean, we, we, we get ourselves lost a little bit in words. And here uh, uh, I want to tackle the word equal, uh, because initially I understood something about equal partnerships. I mean, there, I mean, equality in partnerships is impossible. Uh, there always are inequalities. And what we have to uh, explore, I would say, in the second part, is how we can manage these inequalities in order to make them, uh, uh, let's say, balanced, in order to make sure that the big one is not uh, uh, repressing completely uh, the smaller one, uh, the, the stronger one, the weaker one. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, uh, uh, 
Uh, Mark, uh, let's now turn to Tanya, Tanya Cox, uh, who brings in the perspective of the NGO, the development NGO community. Uh, Tanya, we, we all know that uh, when Cotonou came into being 2000, that it was a very promising agreement with a lot of openings towards uh, uh, civil society. Uh, do you feel that it uh, delivered and are you uh, uh, happy or even uh, unhappy, maybe critical about the partnership of equals uh, uh, principles? How have these been pursued in the past years? Thank you very much, Geert, and thank you for the invitation to be joining you today. Yeah, indeed, um, this word equal is slightly problematic, um, and I must agree with Mark on that one. Uh, it did first appear in the Lomé Convention, so going back a long, long time. Um, but the question is, has it really been realised, and is it even possible to realise it? I think that uh, there's a mixed bag of tricks, if I may say so. I think there's some progress and some going backwards, and that's also where civil society is concerned. But let's, for the moment, first focus on the partnership. Um, I suppose I also have a slight issue, if I may, on whether we really want an interest-driven partnership, because that was also how you referred to the partnership. And th that begs the question, whose interests? And as I think both the previous speakers have been intimating, largely it's been the EU interests that have won out over the course of, of you know, history, as we're looking a little bit at the historical background of this, rather than it really being African interests. And this is, to my mind at least, more and more obvious over the recent uh, years. Um, and because it's the EU interests that are winning out, it seems to me that that's actually part and parcel or even at the heart of uh, the problem, the failings of this relationship. And I prefer to use at the moment the word relationship rather than partnership, because I don't think we're getting there yet. It's at the heart of the extractivist and exploitative model that I see at least the EU applying, where European companies can go into Africa and you know use up their natural resources you, and not pay fair prices, not pay taxes. Um, I believe you mentioned in your introduction the European, the economic, sorry, partnership agreements, the EPAs. All of these things are all part and parcel of a very imbalanced relationship where the EU has, um, not to put too fine a point on it, exploited Africa and African countries. And this is what happens if you have an interest-based partnership, especially when one side is much stronger than the other or more powerful, as I prefer to call it. I think it's a question of power. And why I say the, the progress has been very mixed is because we haven't rebalanced that power relationship at all yet. And the fundamental structural issues haven't changed. We just have to look at the trade relations. Um, we need to make sure that, uh, from my perspective, that what we're going to be doing is we're going to actually try to make a relationship whereby African interests aren't actually harmed, because that's how I see things as they've been progressing over the years. Uh, African countries have not been able to develop the way they might want to be able to develop. I mean, we can just use the way that the West or Global North, however we like to refer to ourselves, has been imposing our own economic growth model with exploitation of people, exploitation of the environment, rampant consumerism, as though this is a good thing. And this is what everyone else needs to be putting in place. We could think about agricultural development in Africa and the way we've imposed this industrial farming model rather than perhaps more eco agroecological methods, which are sustainable, which are culturally more appropriate. And then we can, of course, talk, look at some of the actual um, documents, policies, programming that's actually been going on over the years. And let's look at the most recent years. Um, I believe it was Said that mentioned the EU Africa strategy. Where's the co-creation there? Where's the partnership there? This was just a case of same old, same old, with the EU first deciding what it wants and then imposing it, or hoping that it can impose it, because we haven't got there yet. And then you see signs in the programming of a reversal of what progress had been made before, for example, under the Cotonou Agreement, whereby now, for example, we're not going to be doing the joint programming, which was under the European uh, Development Fund. No, now it's under Global Europe and the EU can decide everything. Look at Team Europe initiatives. They're going to be based on the EU's five geopolitical priorities, not jointly agreed priorities with Africa or with any individual African country, because let's face it, there's a huge 
huge difference between African countries and what African countries might need to prioritize and focus on across the continent. And then perhaps I come to that rather thorny subject of, of, of aid. And um, I think that if I'm very honest, I think that aid may also be one of the things that's holding back progress on the partnership because aid is intricately linked to our colonial history in Africa. And it's intricately linked to the extractivist and exploitative model that we have and that we've created with African countries. It distorts economies, it creates a culture of dependency. And uh, I think it almost justifies, or it it's, could be that for European countries, it's seen to justify actually all the outflows from Africa. It was Jason Hickel, I think, that made the calculation that for every dollar of aid that goes in, $24 flow out, whether that's because of debt payments or um, in illicit financial flows, IPRs, whatever it may be. But basically, the global south is developing rich countries, not the other way around. Okay, Tanya, I think we should stop here. Thank you very much for these first uh, observations, very critical observations. Um, you really call for... Uh, managing uh, uh, this relationship uh, yeah, and the inequalities in a better way and, and, and rebalancing the power uh, relationship. Let's now turn to Sheikh, Sheikh Tidian. He recently wrote uh, a very remarkable report for Open Society Africa, Open Society Foundation Africa on the EU-Africa Partnership and African Civil Society Engagement Strategy. So maybe let's ask Sheikh whether uh, he, uh, in all these years uh, in which he has been following Europe-Africa relations, Africa-Europe relations, uh, whether he has seen any progress towards more uh, equality and more uh, mutual uh, interest. Please, Sheikh. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gert, for, for inviting me to this uh, conversation on the Africa-Europe partnership. Uh, as you said, uh, and I will just follow uh, those who just took the floor before me by saying that for me, uh, despite the fact that both parties, Europe and Africa, have reiterated on several occasions that uh, they wish to build a partnership of equal, uh, my opinion is that it is more a slogan than a reality. Uh, one of the uh, particularities of the Africa-Europe uh, partnership is that for a large section of population, both in Africa and Europe, it is a kind of process that is reproduced almost identically uh, year after year, summit after summit, action plan after action plan, before uh, giving very clear benefits. If you look at it, you, it is like uh, from a year to another, in particular from the, if you read the declarations from the summits, Africa-Europe summit, since the one in Cairo to the last one, uh, you see that they are just reiterating the same literature, the same commitments, and so on. And I, I even I was reading a, a kind of survey done by the uh, German uh, NGO platform Venro. Uh, among 363 civil society actors from Europe and Africa uh, on this uh, relation, and let me tell you that more than 70 uh, percent of those who had who was surveyed was saying that this partnership was uh, quite bad and and um, and was not delivering really the the expectations and results that were um, uh, uh, that we were looking at from him. And on, uh, let, let's just talk very quickly on the economic side. My, my opinion is that the the partnership in the economic side. I think we lost uh, Sheikh. Uh, we'll give him two more minutes when he's back uh, uh, with his connection, but let's uh, now turn uh, to Lidet. Lidet, please, your three minutes. You have been in this business for quite some time. Uh, how do you perceive the evolution of this partnership in the past years? And in the second part, we will look at the future, of course. Please, Lidet. Thank you, Heert. Um, 
So unlike some of the panelists here, I do not have the benefit of talking about the EU Africa partnership from lived experience. Um, but I think that has also given me maybe an overview. And the thing that I want to sort of say a few things about is the narratives um, around or the narratives uh, framing the partnership, uh, because I think this is one of the changes uh, we have seen in the partnership. Um, and I think in this regard, I think there has been a change in how uh, the, the partnership is understood, uh, because I think now perhaps there is a more heightened tendency to look at the uh, partnership as a negotiated partnership, uh, where it's clear that both parties come with interest, as opposed to seeing it um, as a partnership in which one relates to the other based on philanthropy and goodwill. Um, so I, I think perhaps uh, now both parties um, come with the attitude um, that, okay, since this is an interest-based negotiation, what are my interests? What do I want to get out of the partnership? Um, how do I assert my positions and so forth? So perhaps treat it with bit, a bit more uh, political weight um, than uh, perhaps before. And I think this is also important because um, in the eyes of the public, um, I think it has perhaps debunked this idea uh, that I think was um, um, held by uh, the public on both sides, that this relationship um, is based on you know, goodwill, humanistic principles, phil philanthropy, um, and, and things like that. And I think uh, perhaps how uh, the migration uh, flows between the two continents was managed in the past um, 10 years, let's say, um, I think has debunked this myth that the two uh, continents relate to each other in which one is doing the other a favor. Um, and in my opinion, this is then progress. Um, I think this is uh, progress because I think it's more honest. Um, I think true colors are coming out, let's say, uh, to, to be a bit more uh, provocative. Uh, but while I think this is progress, I don't think we have quite arrived at the equality um, part of uh, you know, your earlier question. I think we're making progress towards achieving this equality of partnerships, but we are not there yet. Um, and I think that is so because uh, to begin with, the two continents are not negotiating from the same um, economic strength. So that has implications on who can push uh, what kind of strength. But I think it's also because um, of perceptions or because um, old uh, habits die hard um, and people who on the, on the who are on the uh, side of uh, giving, uh, Ambassador Jinyet uh, mentioned this earlier, um, also feel like, also tend to see because aid is part of the partnership, it is the most important part of the partnership and try to use it to uh, to sway um, things in one direction or another to call the shots to put it uh, very simply. Um, so I think because uh, these dynamics are at play, we haven't really achieved at the partnership of um, equals part of um, the, the partnership. But I think um, it is increasingly becoming apparent that it's interest-based. And unlike uh, Tanya, I think this is a good thing because I think this is the more honest thing. I think this is also the thing that perhaps could alert African governments then to negotiate, uh, to treat this as a political negotiation and to negotiate um, assertively. Thank you very much, uh, Lidet. I don't know whether Sheikh is again online. I don't see him. If you hear me, Sheikh, please, uh, uh, you are still... Uh... Are you there, Sheikh? No, Sheikh is not there. I don't see him for the time being. Uh, we'll give him a little, a little bit more time in the second round. But for now, I would like to invite people uh, to put questions in the chat. Uh, we've had a bilan that was uh, put up by the five speakers, a bilan that was quite critical, a bilan that uh, repeated quite a few times that uh, we use sometimes hollow words uh, that we need to uh, uh, yeah, understand that this is still a power relationship where there is quite some work to be done, uh, that there is uh, uh, work to be done to manage inequalities. Uh, inequalities uh, are, or few, uh, full uh, equal relations are probably not uh, possible, but we can manage the inequalities better. Um, we will look in the second round what the possible options are for the future. But for now, are there any reactions from the audience? I see that we are 117 people connected. Are there any people who would like to put questions in the chat? Um, I'm just looking 
for the time being, there is no reaction. I would therefore propose that we go to the second round, which is, of course, the more interesting round, eh? because uh, in the second round, we promised ourselves to be prospective. And we said that we would really look at incentives, incentives in the coming years that could help us evolve towards improved and more equal partnership relations. And the question that we have put to all five speakers is to indicate where they see real scope uh, and opportunities for progress. And then we will also ask uh, uh, to reflect on the actors, eh, who are the different actors who should play a more prominent role in the partnership relationship uh, in, in the future. And then finally, we also have asked uh, the participants to reflect on how a more equal interest driven partnership, although Tanya was not necessarily in agreement with interest driven, but how a more equal partnership could be translated also in joint action in the multilateral uh, organizations in the multilateral systems. I would like to start now with Mark, please Mark. Your three to five minutes for the second round, and I okay. invite you everyone to put questions. Right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <clears throat> very schematically, uh, I think we have to move beyond the existing arrangements and existing institutions. Uh, ACP doesn't make any sense. I'm sorry for people that spend their lifetime building it up, but. Africa, Caribbean and Pacific have nothing in common, apart from the fact that they, they were at one point in time European colonies. Secondly, it's not only ACP that should be kind of eroded gently as an institution, but also uh, the European neighborhood policy that has not been mentioned. Because southern part, the, the southern part of the Mediterranean is part of the neighborhood policy. Now, eastern neighborhood and southern neighborhood doesn't have anything in common, apart from the fact that they are neighbors from the European Union. Because, I mean, geographically, politically, economically, culturally, I mean, religiously, and so on and so forth, there is nothing that binds the East European neighbors and the South European neighbors. So that means that what we should strive at is to uh, uh, have a movement where southern, the southern neighborhood and Africa south of the Sahara kind of come together. I know that it is not something you can do overnight. I know institutions are uh, very difficult to, to review and to, uh, to erode, but I think this should be the aim of an African strategy as it is also laid down uh, in the paper. Uh, of, uh, let's say, 2020. Uh, okay, now, when we do that, let's take a leaf out of the book of some of the experiences we have. First of all, uh, the former Lome Cotonou uh, arrangements. One interesting part of it is that it has been a negotiated agreement, that it has a kind of a legally binding taste to it, uh, feeling to it. I think it is worthwhile if we work together as African continent represented by African Union and European Union representing the, the, the let's say the Commission representing the European Union, uh, that we go and negotiate something that is legally binding and bind us together. Uh, another thing where we can put some uh, where we can draw some lessons from is the Union for the Mediterranean. Totally dysfunctional at the moment because it hit. It, I mean, it sits together with many other uh, aspects, and I mean, I'm not going to go in detail why it doesn't work. But the important or the interesting aspect of the Union for the Mediterranean is that it uh, is a kind of a co-managed. There are co-presidencies, and there is an institution uh, for in, for implementation also of a certain number of projects. Doesn't work very well, but. Common institutions, co-presidencies of, of an agreement is something that I think uh, could be interesting uh, to, to work upon. Now, if we look at the content, what are we going to uh, uh, kind of do? Uh, I think we have already a kind of a blueprint of what could be done in arrangements that have already been negotiated with the African Union. They're probably at this moment not going very far, but I think they are very promising. First of all, is the continental, the African continental free trade area. Many people are dying their feet. Africa is very complex. You have all the EPAs. You have various things uh, that, uh, that that hang uh, don't hang together. But there is this proposal for an African continental free trade area. So I would say, as European Union, let's do what we can in order to make this happen uh, and facilitate the coming into being of a uh, 
an agreement at that moment between uh, the African continental free trade area and European Union. As far as the uh, financing is concerned, the trade, uh, the 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 uh, the aid uh, part of it, uh, there is this very interesting uh, 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 Africa Europe Alliance for Sustainable Investment and Jobs, and there is also this facility now in the new uh, in the new uh, development instrument uh, for uh, private public partnerships for using uh, 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 the the grant money as seed money in order to do co financing with private sector and so on and so forth. I think we have there a number of initiatives that have been developing already. There are many more than that uh, on which we can build. So to sum up, um, we have to go in the direction of an agreement between Europe and Africa, Africa represented by European, by African Union uh, the, and Europe divided, uh, represented by the European Union. Uh, we have to make a binding legal framework. We have to have common institutions that also are involved in the implementation and the, the supervising of the, of the, the, uh, the, the functioning uh, of the new agreement that we're going to make. And we have already a number of building blocks that we can use there. Uh, uh, and I've, I've been referring to the continental free trade area uh, and to the uh, Africa-Europe uh, Alliance. I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much, Mark. And we will come back to some of the points that you made, uh, very interesting points. Uh, let's now turn to Said, and I would like to give Said also a question from the audience. Uh, I don't know whether everyone is also able to read the chat, because now we are really flooded with very interesting observations, very op interesting questions. And uh, in your uh, prospective thinking, uh, Said, maybe you should also say something on how uh, African officials are uh, organizing and preparing themselves for these negotiations with the European Union, because uh, the person who put that question seems to see some uh, uh, inconsistencies in the way uh, certain parts of Africa, uh, certain countries, certain officials within the same country seem to favor certain agreements against other agreements. So this type of inconsistency, what can be done about this? Please, uh, Said. Please unmute, unmute. Yeah, I'm saying it's true. I mean, that there are inconsistencies in, in Africa. And this has to do with, the, uh, what can I say, some vested interest uh, of some member states or within uh, uh, member, mem member states. For example, we have seen uh, when they were to discuss the, the post Cotonou agreement, the member states of the African Union have entrusted their ambassadors in Brussels to discuss that. So what would you expect from the European, the, your ambassador in Brussels, if not to, to, to broadly support the Cotonou uh, agreement process? So there are these kind of consistencies in, the, in our, uh, our countries. But I, I, I think most of the colleagues have uh, refer to the fact that this relation between the continent, Africa and Europe is largely driven by the European Union. Uh, from my experience when I was at the African Union, the impression we are getting is that first, when they have an idea in the European Union, they move fast. And they move fast, but not as faster than the bureaucracy within the European Union uh, institutions. But once they have uh, finish their consultations with the European Union, we get the impression that the room for negotiation and changes of the draft is very limited because it, it will require again another round of consultation within the European Union, the European Union consult, uh, consulted, consultative process. So it's almost take it or leave it. Since there are financial instruments in it, attached to it, well, people tend to look at the financial uh, instruments and to forget about the, the rest, where there are commitments from both sides, mutual commitments. I think personally, as I said earlier, the way forward, the rendezvous between Europe and Africa is through a binding, like our colleague has just said, a binding agreement between the two continents through their respective institutions, the European Union and the African Union. We have, despite all the critical assessment that we had 
we have covered the big trip I mean, together between Europe and Africa so far with all problems and shortcomings, but still we have come a long way together. But really to continue our, our travel together, I think it should go through this kind of strategic binding uh, continental uh, rapport between Africa and Europe and uh, the exit for the ECP because really, as my uh, colleague has said also earlier, well, how can you bring together the ECP, the, the, uh, the, the Caribbean and the African together? Why would you separate the North Africa from the South African sub-Saharan uh, continent? So I think it's for uh, people to reflect deeply and to engage frankly in that kind of, uh, of relation. The, the blame is not on the European Union only, but the blame is on the African Union because, uh, again, the, the, we tend to look at the financial implication of the agreement and to ignore the other aspects of the, uh, of the agreement. I think it's time that we negotiate uh, word to word the agreements and we commit ourselves genuinely to the implementation of the agreement. And in that, in that context, what I, I have always highlighted as the unique of the relation is that this is a partnership that is based on a big set of common shared values between Europe and Africa. Africa has embraced democracy, human rights despite shortcomings, but at least this is the way forward. And this is exactly what, what the values shared by the, by the European Union. I think it's a valuable partnership that needs to be pursued through that kind of of strategic partnership. But we have, uh, Said, we have uh, the Joint Africa-Europe strategy since 2007. That was the time that you were still uh, African Union yeah. commissioner. Why did it not uh, materialize? What was the, the weakness of that strategy? Because it was uh, uh, promoted as, as, as a new way forward for a continent-to-continent -continent type of dialogue. Uh, at the end of the day, it didn't work. Is it because it did not have a legal character? Uh, what was the, the reason? First of all, I mean, first of all, I mean, I would, from the African Union perspective, we have unfortunately so many other decisions within the African Union which have not been implemented neither. So it has to do with the political will and the capacity to implement our own decisions. It's both lack of political will, second, the capacity to, to implement. That's, mm -hmm. uh, and the second, uh, Again, uh, the, uh, I, I, in my introduction earlier, I said that we, we, we negotiated to some extent, but it was essentially proposed by the European Union, as other colleagues have said. And lastly, uh, at least in the peace and security uh, uh, cluster, I think we, uh, we have been working together. I think we, there was a good level of implementation of our joint commitments in peace and security. Uh, that has been, because as you see, it has been the forefront of the uh, of the relation between the European Union and Africa, peace and security and governance to, uh, to some extent. So, and especially with the adoption of the peace facility in 2003, 2004, it has really revealed the, the potential of the relations between Europe and uh, Africa, and it has really ex pushed forward the cooperation and to some extent, we have, to some extent, fulfilled the general obligations in the, in the joint statement of Lisbon. Yes, thank you very much, uh, uh, Said. Uh, let's turn to Sheikh, because we lost him in the first round, and I'm sure that he still has a lot to say about the partnership in the trade negotiations. And by the way, there was also a very interesting uh, question in the chat, so I would like to connect it as well uh, to the debate. Should we pursue with the IPAS uh, after the launch of the Africa continental free trade area? So the question to you, Sheikh, uh, what were your experiences with these EPAs? To what extent are these still uh, helpful in uh, bringing uh, the Africa, the AFCTA uh, closer? Uh, I see that you're not online anymore. I hope you will hear me. Please, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, Gert. Uh, can you hear me, please? Yeah, we hear you. Okay, yeah. thank you. I want to, uh, to all you and participants, um, internet is quite uh, instable. 
we're doing some work for to to give so i was talking about um coming to your question uh you was uh, you're talking about the, the the trade dimension i was explaining that uh my my point of view on this partnership is that uh we are uh more on um some challenges and weaknesses and uh, failure than on the objective of building a, a, a partnership of equals because we can take into account or we can raise many many examples i was when i my, my internet was uh, cut i was talking about some examples on how what europe have done for of course ldc is what europe is doing on on aid and assistance and etc for africa but if you look uh, sure. deeply on it that is not creating a kind of a structural transformation uh, in africa you can come from the lomec conventions to cotonou and to take also the EB, uh, the eco, uh, everything but arms uh, regime for ldcs all the, these did not allow african countries to to uh, accede to uh, structural transformation and to be able to develop their productive capacity in order to avoid the or to escape from the current situation of exporting to Europe only raw materials and so on to be able to to process. And I was even giving an example concrete that we are facing here in Senegal on fishery sector, where the government have signed an agreement with European Union, which allow some uh, um, fishing vessel originating from Spain, uh, Portugal and Italy to to fish in the uh, Senegalese seas and export the, the fish to, to Europe. And that creates really a, a very uh, strong debate here in the country because most of the stakeholders was asking why uh, the government can allow uh, these vessels to come and fish here and not uh, land these uh, products in Senegal, process it here in order to industrialize and just export the finished product. This is, if you put it in line, with what you said about the economic partnership agreement this kind of situation is uh, one of the uh, arguments used by some one some of the private sector stakeholders but most of the civil society organizations in africa against the the economic partnership agreement because it was quite clear for all of them that uh, we, one cannot have kind of these uh, ambitious trade relations of from uh, between Europe and Africa, which will open widely the market in a way uh, for Europe to be able to maintain its market access to, to Europe, to, to Africa, and uh, Africa not being able to also send uh, finished products, manufactured goods to, to European market. And this uh, is still a challenge in Africa. EPA is still rejected in m most of the regions uh, in particular here in West Africa, where countries are, have all signed the agreement, but they have not ratified, and Nigeria is still not signing this because they are still saying that it has a lot of and many challenges for Africa's interest or these regions' interest or its objectives and strategy and also ambition to be able to industrialize and so on. And one is one of the situations that we are we are seeing now, and that you can put in link with IFCFTA, is that in most of the African regions, the economic communities, you can see that now they are dealing with Europe in four or five trade different trade regimes. If you come to West Africa, you have the the econo the EPA for Ghana, which is its own EPA one. You have the interim EPA for Cote d'Ivoire. You have the Nigeria, which is on now on the general uh, system of preferences. You have the LDCs who are now in the economic, um, everything but arm regime and uh, uh, also with another uh, trade regime. So you have a region which is trying to build its uh, regional integration, but trading with Europe in five different trade regimes. It's a huge challenge uh, uh, in the region. Coming to the IFCFTA, while we are negotiating the IFCFTA, most of the uh, civil society organizations, but also some private sector, even in the governments or in the regional communities, you can hear some voices saying that it is not very uh, coherent, it is not consistent to 
continue pursue implementing or trying to implement the economic partnership agreement where the African continent, the regions are trying also in the same time to put in place the, the IFCFTA. And most of them are using the argument of IFCFTA for saying that we should stop, do a kind of an e-pass in order to finish or the um, uh, implementation of IFCFTA for avoiding those two processes to to neutralize or to to uh, uh, constitute a kind of obstacle for for each of them, and also um, in this process of negotiating the post Cotonou, most of the uh, stakeholders are also saying that there is it is not very coherent for EU to push uh, implementing those EPAs in a context where the basic line which is the the Cotonou agreement have, have been changed and the the new frame is not very clear for all of them. So this allows me to talk about this matter of, of coherence. The problem of coherence is one of the main challenges when you come to the, to the Africa-Europe partnership. Um, in the European side, uh, just to very quickly on this, most of the um, stakeholders are thinking that both in Africa and in Europe, there are some clear uh, uh, situations that does not allow this partnership to be to be consistent and to give some results. The first, I think, in the I, European think Sheik, side, I think I think Sheikh, your point is clear. It's very much uh, focusing on the coherence, uh, the policy coherence. You gave a few examples, uh, fisheries, also the trade, the IPAS. I think we have to move on to the other panelists, but you will come back in the chat. There is a few questions that also relate to what you're saying here. So keep your answers for that. Uh, a uh, moment that we will uh, still uh, go back to the chat. I would like right. to turn to uh, 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 Lidet at this moment. Uh, please, Lidet, uh, after what you have uh, been uh, hearing from different sides, uh, the incentives in the coming years to evolve towards a more equal partnership, how do you see this uh, yourself from your background and your experience? Mm. Um, I mean, I, I think I do subscribe to the idea that perhaps uh, for Africa negotiating through the African Union uh, would result uh, or would uh, promote its interest than uh, through the ACP. But I think the more important thing for me is that um, the, the drivers or the factors that drive the partnership between the um, EU or sorry, the uh, Europe and Africa are beyond the institutional arrangements under which um, they are negotiated. So when we talk about incentives, when we talk about in the future, um, sort of envisioning a partnership of um, equals, I think we also need to understand how um, so far, how the, the partnership between the two continents have sort of become an important um, issue and why Africa, in my opinion at least, um, has slowly become um, an interesting and exciting partner uh, for the European Union. And here, um, I think we need to acknowledge that uh, part of the, the um, dynamic between the two continents changed because of the economic development that several African countries have registered um, and how the prospects for investment and pro the prospects for uh, trade have allured a lot of Afri uh, European Union uh, countries to take the partnership seriously and to not take Africa for granted. I think it's also important to acknowledge, and someone has asked this question um, in the chat box as well, that part of um, the factors or the, the drivers um, that I think have um, um, challenged this uh, static and uh, very much goodwill or philanthropy driven uh, partnership is also the emergence of um, um, other global powers uh, like China, who have shown um, incredible interest in engaging with Africa, investing in Africa and trading with Africa, which I think had put Europe, uh, had made Europe a bit sensitive, uh, sorry, nervous, and which I think has been a good thing for the partnership because um, again, I think this, this these developments have allowed uh, the two continents not to take each other for granted. Now, going forward, um, I think speaking of incentives, I think it's important to acknowledge that when we talk about a, a partnership of equals, we have to be honest that one party has more incentives towards to work towards this uh, 
um, uh, equality than the other. I mean, this is, uh, this is I, I think, something that we uh, should be um, honest about. So I think um, if that is the case, then I, I think there's a lot of responsibility in the hands of um, African governments then to understand the political economy dynamics here and that um, they are the ones that are going to lose out if this partnership is not um, equal. So as a result, I think uh, what they need to do is primarily get their house in order. This touches on some of the things that Ambassador Jinget was also referring to, um, be it in terms of you know being clear on how they're going to negotiate with the European Union, what their interests are, being very clear about that, and then also defending those interests and pushing back when it's not working for them. The other aspect of, I think, keeping the house in order also relates to how they are governing their respective um, countries, be it in terms of delivering on um, economic objectives, but also governance objectives. And um, I think delivering on government governance um, objectives, they shouldn't be doing it because the EU demands it of them. Um, absolutely not. I, I think they should be doing it because Technically, that's what they are empowered to do, is to deliver on good governance for their own citizens. Um, so I think unless we are able to change the material aspects of um, um, African um, economies, this partnership is likely not to achieve, um, and not, it's not going to be uh, governed in an equal uh, way. And then uh, the other thing, and this is my final point, is also looking forward, um, in addition to the economic prospects that um, I think the continent will, will gather, in addition to the global dynamics that I've mentioned that I think could change the uh, calculus between uh, the two continents, I think perhaps the other thing that gives me hope is also a generational shift in how we think about ourselves and how we think about others and how uh, people like the, the current African generation, European generation, think of themselves and, and the other. And this is because, I mean, people my age are certainly not going to accept a European Union or a European partner that, you know, dictates the terms of the partnership. Um, I think there would also be a very low tolerance uh, for things like, you know, non-reciprocal uh, norm policing that we see as a, a key aspect of the partnership now. I think a lot, a lot of these things will be uh, increasingly resisted uh, from the African partners, but I think from the European side as well, because of this generational change, um, the um, uh, what is it, like the ambition to assert these kinds of um, attitudes would also uh, cease to exist in due time, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Lidet, for bringing the debate also to the actors who could play a role. That's also a question that we have put to you. Eh? Who are these actors, uh, youth, uh, the new generations who can play a role in the future partnerships? Um, maybe a question as well uh, that is of interest uh, to Tanya. And I would uh, also ask Tanya to reflect on another question that was indirectly related to uh, part of your earlier uh, statements, where you said that aid is quite a thorny issue. Uh, we all talk about uh, structural transformation that is needed beyond aid, but is there still a role to be played for aid? Eh? Your role is to convince everyone in Europe to reserve 0.7% of uh, GNP for uh, ODA, Official Development Assistance, but is this still uh, needed if we talk about partnerships of equals, if we talk about different types of relationships that go beyond uh, dependency? Please, Tanya. Thank you, Geert. I'd like to bounce off something that Lidette said that I really liked. She said there was more incentive on one side of the partnership to work towards equality than the other. I'd like to sort of counter argue that one, but saying the same thing, I think, as Lidette, and to say that, yes, but there is also one side that needs to do more work to achieve that equality. And from my perspective, then that's that side is the EU. The EU needs to do more work to reach that state of equality, if that's the word that we want to use, rather than fair or meaningful or something else in terms of the partnerships and the relationships. You're quite right here when you say that aid is important for us. I think that um, aid plays an extremely important role if it's done in the right way. It can also be, uh, as you said, thorny, because it's often not done in the right way. From our perspective, and it links a little bit to what some of the other speakers were saying, at least ODA should be used for grants and not for loans, because then you, we start seeing the problem of the debt and the rising debt. And this is one of the, the issues that is keeping Africa um, in a less powerful position vis-a-vis -vis the, the European Union. 
The other thing that was mentioned earlier on was these public-private partnerships and PPPs. I think, again, we need to be extremely careful when and how those kinds of, of, of um, agreements or partnerships are used. Because, for example, um, something that Africa needs a lot is to be able to develop on the, the human capital, as the EU calls it, so human development side of things. Absolutely not. A PPP is absolutely not appropriate for any investment in essential public services, for example. You do not want to privatize health and education and so on, because there the benefit goes to the private sector and the risk goes to society. So, again, we need to be extremely careful how and when we use aid, uh, with the how also being important. I think aid probably has an important role to play, but we should imagine it being for a limited time. It's a bit like INGOs. In, in a way, what we want to do is succeed. We want to be out of business. That should be our objective, that one day we're out of business. We've got nothing left to do because we're living in equal societies where everybody has well-being. Equal societies, again, equal in inverted commas, we will never be perfectly equal, but more so. So I think that's what we need to envisage for aid as well. And aid has a role to play, but we need to try to imagine we have a game plan where in 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, we no longer need it because Africa has managed to, and other parts of the world have managed to get to an economic development stage where they don't need to be receiving help anymore. They can solve their own problems. And in this vein, maybe there are a few things that I would like to suggest. Um, and one of them is... Um, uh, domestic resource mobilization. This is extremely important for African countries. It needs to be building up its own source of revenue, because then, of course, it doesn't need aid in the same way. And here there are a couple of things that need to happen, and the EU should be playing its part here. One is Africa needs to be building up its own private sector. So it needs to be creating that enabling environment, as we call it, the business climate, whereby businesses can flourish. And I mean locally grown African businesses, of course, not European companies coming and investing. The other thing that needs to happen is that we need to close all these loopholes on um, capital flight, because there are huge quantities of money leaving the African continent every year. Uh, UNCTAD has given the, um, the estimate of about $89 billion leaving the African continent every year. I mean, that's twice the amount that goes in in aid. So we see the discrepancies here, and this is the issue that I think we need to be tackling it in a much broader, more systemic manner. So that's one of the things that I think that should happen. But if I may, I'd love to bounce back on something else that was mentioned, and that's um, some of these geopolitical challenges that the EU is facing and why I think the EU has suddenly become much more honest about wanting an interest-based um, relationship with other countries, but Africa, the continent of Africa being one of them. It's facing a lot of disruption. I mean, disruption is the name of the game in the sort of global arena at the moment, and the speed of change is increasing, as we all know. And so it's in the EU's interest to have a partner, a partner with whom it can see eye to eye, but it's also in Africa's interest. And here, perhaps, we should be looking at the role of China and the, the geopolitical challenge that China could be facing, not just to the EU, because the EU sees it as competition, but also its role in Africa. And I saw it in one of the, the comments about the, the Belt and Road project. China is not about aid. It's about power. It's about control. And um, probably the EU and Africa could work together in a more positive and constructive manner to be able to then engage in a positive and constructive manner with China. Because I think that's what's necessary. It's not that China's the, the, the bad guy here. China's just doing what a, you know we've been doing for years. It's investing elsewhere. It's making money. But okay. China's actually, yeah. can I just add one comment here? Because very, China's very, a, very brief, very brief, you know, yes. China's a really interesting example from some perspectives in terms of how to develop, because it's one of the very successful, it's a successful, it's really developed. It's from a very, very poor state. And this was because of state development state-led development strategies. And I think that the influence of Europe in almost forbidding other countries to allow their state to play an important role in the development of their country, that's, that's maybe disadvantageous to countries. So that's maybe something else that African countries need to be thinking about is the role the state, their state can and should play in their own development. And that they need to fight back against Europe perhaps when Europe says, no, 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 small state, we don't want the state involved. Thank you very much, uh, Tanya.
we still have 20 minutes left. What I will do now is to select some questions from the chat and I will ask uh, some of you to react, not all of you on the same question, but of course you are always free to also read the chat. And if there are any questions where you feel that you would like to say something about, uh, don't hesitate to do so. But uh, I will select a few questions and uh, ask for very uh, short replies. Building on what uh, Tanya mentioned about China, we had a question in the chat, how does the growing role of China in Africa influence the relationship between the European Union and Africa? Said, that's a question for you. Please unmute, please unmute. <laughs> From the African Union perspective, you know, uh, as much as the, they are, I think, determined to build a very strong partnership with the, with the European Union, uh, the way we have spoken about the way forward, but at the same time, they, uh, in the African Union, uh, they believe that uh, Africa should be able to build partnership with others. There is no exclusive partnership, neither with the European Union, nor with the, the China or Japan or India or Turkey. So, I mean, Africa is uh, developing uh, I, and, they, and they need the support of all those willing to support Africa based on mutual interest. So, uh, I, I think the issue of China is not yet uh, ready for joint discussion between uh, Africa and uh, Europe. I remember when I was there, I was still before I left the African Union, I remember that our colleagues from the European Union wanted us no, to, discuss, to, to discuss our joint approach yeah. to China. And our response to them is that, no, nah, please, no, you have been dealing with China all this time alone on your own. Now that China is getting good, all right, right. taking some different shape, you want to... Do you have more? Uh, you could quickly mix. Sorry, someone should unmute. Someone should... Uh, sh someone should mute, please. PIG, please. Yeah. In, 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 in nutshell, I mean, clearly, I think the Africa is not yet ready to engage uh, with Europe formally on how on their relation with, uh, with China, because they believe that they should engage in relations with all stakeholders based on mutual uh, advantage. Thank you. Maybe a quick reaction also from Mark from your own experience, because you have been involved in uh, uh, different types of uh, partnerships. Eh? You also were ambassador to Russia. Uh, are there any lessons to be learned for the Europe-Africa partnership from the experiences that you had elsewhere? Uh, well, I think, first of all, Europe should uh, draw its own lessons from uh, uh, China uh, and what China is doing at this moment through the uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and I'm afraid that this is a bit like reorganizing the almost the world economy in function of the Chinese needs. So um, I, I, I do not think it's just a matter of uh, China in Africa, which kind of upset Europe. We should be more upset by uh, the, uh, the, the, the grip that China is getting on, uh, on ports, on all the kind of transport facilities, uh, combined with industrial investment and function of Chinese needs and so on and so forth. I mean, the list is endless uh, and we seem to be sleepwalking uh, into, into a situation uh, where we will wake up and see that, in fact, the whole all of our whole uh, economic life is being determined what was happening, what what is happening in Beijing. So it's, for me, it's first of all a European problem to come to grips with what China is doing and develop uh, an honest relationship with them, um, uh, rather than just, I mean, drawing or teaching lessons to uh, to to Africa how should they, they should deal with it. Thank you. Uh, maybe a question uh, for Sheikh, who has been around for quite some time. Uh, the question uh, from the chat uh, deals with the overlapping and competing institutional processes. Um, how will uh, both continents, in your view, manage uh, in the coming years this ongoing fragmentation? Eh? We will have this OACPS, Organization of ACP States EU, uh, agreement. It still needs to be signed. There's still some hurdles to be taken before it will be signed. But at the same time, we also have the continent to continent processes, African Union, European Union. 
So how will we be able to deal with that uh, fragmentation? How is this being perceived from an African perspective? Please, Sheikh. Yes, thank you very much, Gert. Uh, if you if you allow me, just one once the thirty second on what have been said on the on the China uh, presence in Africa. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, and so on. You can show the, the 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 fact that EU is changing its behavior because of the presence of of the China. That's why I think that it is important to be able to move from this current situation to a new partnership to change. First of all the strategy, uh, the objective, and the methods. For the objective, I think we are still, in the European side, in my opinion, in a kind of... Uh, Sheikh, Sheikh, we, we lost you. You, you should uh, unmute. Please, Sheikh. We don't hear you. We don't hear you. No, I think it's not working. We will have to move to another question uh, because, Sheikh, we don't hear you. No, maybe a question uh, uh, to Lidet, uh, also a question from the chat. Um, Lidet, uh, the chat is asking uh, what all is of the diaspora in all this uh, Europe Africa business. Um, do you have any views on this? Yeah, it, it depends on, I guess, what kind of uh, diaspora we're talking about because, you know, in, in Europe I joke about this, but there are like the good African migrants and then uh, the not so good <laughs> African migrants. So I think um, so far there has been uh, maybe more um, um, interaction or more efforts to, uh, for example, bridge the uh, popular opinions and experiences, um, uh, aspirations for the partnership between um, Africans that reside um, in, in Africa, um, sorry, Africans that reside in, in Europe, um, and then Europeans uh, here, but also um, uh, African diaspora uh, sort of going back uh, to their countries for investments, for work and um, other purposes. So I think the role of the diaspora perhaps is um, in terms of changing uh, popular perceptions about, you know, what the other is um, and maybe giving more of a, a tangible um, lived experience sort of, sort of uh, uh, yeah, understanding of what the, the diversity within Africa and then the diversity within uh, Europe as well. I, so I, I think that is one. And then the other thing is also um, the possibilities that the diaspora presents to um, uh, to Africa in terms of remittances, so uh, economically, uh, but also some uh, knowledge transfer. I think there's also a possibility that uh, because of this knowledge transfer uh, developments in, in Africa could, or things in Africa uh, development projects, for example, could be uh, done better. So I think there are um, those kinds of roles, but perhaps less political. So when it comes to the actual negotiation of the terms of the partnership, um, I haven't really seen either side trying to engage their diaspora in uh, political negotiations or trying to use the diaspora for political uh, purposes. Thank you, uh, Lidet. I see that we still have 10 minutes uh, left. Um, there is one particular question that we did not uh, answer yet. Of course, there's many more questions that we did not answer, but there's one particular question that we had put to you at a certain moment, and I would like to give each of you two minutes to reflect on this. And this relates to interest-driven partnerships between Europe and Africa. How could this be translated in joint cooperation in the multilateral system? Because when I read, for example, the February joint communication of the European Union on the EU and multilateralism, there's a lot of talk of working better and more together between Europe and Africa. So the question there is, is this a, a realistic perspective and what should be done to make sure that that cooperation is effectively taking place in the multilateral arena? Uh, let's start maybe this time with Tanya. Thank you very much. Um, I think that in this 
perspective, this is one of those areas where the EU needs to move uh, towards Africa and towards supporting Africa more in the multilateral uh, environment. Africa has, I mean, there are two or three examples that I could cite where Africa has made some very clear demands and that Europe has not supported them and not supported them as they should have done. So if we look to make some kind of a partnership, then they should move on these issues. So the first one would be making international governance much more democratic, more transparent. We could look to, for example, IMF and the World Bank and the voting rights. Africa has about 40%, if I'm not mistaken, of the voting rights, but they're 85% of the global population, just as one example. The other example of, of where Africa has made some very clear requests and should have been supported in international governance is this classic case of the vaccines. And we don't need to go into that story. We're all, we're all well aware of it. But Europe should have supported Africa to be able to, um, so that the TRIPS waiver was, uh, so that the TRIPS was, uh, waiver was agreed to. Um, I think that if Europe makes these kinds of moves towards Africa, then indeed one can have a more uh, a more balanced partnership, and that's I suppose the the term that I would like to use for it. There's a third a third example that I would at least give, and it's something that in civil society is important for us, and that's this idea of a global tax body. This it would be um, a body situated within the UN whereby uh, tax rates would be negotiated. And we've just had this conversation in the G7 um, where a 15% global minimum tax rate was um, agreed, which is frankly scandalous. Could Europe and Africa work together to make sense of this and, and have a sensible proposition that could then be uh, pushed through the UN, which would then end the race to the bottom on um, trying to decrease tax rates in you know, for example, by European companies in African countries. I think there are a number of areas where um, in the multilateral arena, quite a lot could be done to make um, a more balanced, more equal partnership and to balance power as well between the various different actors and countries. Thank you. Sheikh, if you are uh, connected again, if you're online, uh, final two minutes uh, observations, uh, including on Europe and Africa and the multilateral system. Do you hear us? Sheikh? No. In that case, I would like to uh, invite uh, Said to give your views with your long-standing experience and please unmute, please unmute. Well, uh, I, I, there must be certainly room for uh, working together between Africa and Europe at multilateral, multilateral level, clearly, especially on issues, thematic issues like environment, climate change, etc. But uh, I fully agree with Tanya, it has to do with the uh, global governance uh, uh, challenge. And the way, uh, uh, the way the most powerful are deciding on behalf of the rest of the international community. For example, the OAU African Union has always been uh, demanding uh, that uh, we should reform the Security Council to allow Africa to have its to be represented within the Security Council, and this has never got uh, never got support of the uh, global global European Union. We have also uh, the issue of Libya. We have seen uh, how um, the African Union was uh, uh, was stopped from uh, undertaking its uh, its mediation, and uh, instead there was uh, intervention led by NATO and within NATO European Union. So we have some uh, some misunderstandings at the global level. So uh, the strat uh, mutually beneficial strategy could uh, reduce the gap between the two partners and will allow them to uh, to work uh, together as much as possible internationally. Mike, your two minutes. Uh, yeah, um, well, interesting multilateralism, uh, but um, I think it was Tandy who mentioned the 15% uh, uh, tax on companies. Uh, we wouldn't even get it through the European Union. Uh, so, uh, I think the first issue is in multilateral organizations, what is the role and what is the strength of European Union 
uh, when very often uh, we operate there in, in very diverse uh, kind of uh, positions. Uh, we haven't one position in the World Bank. We have not one position in IMF. We are just between various constituencies. So in a number of organizations where it really matters, where the international multilateral cooperation really matters, uh, I think the first problem for the European Union would, would be to get its own act together uh, before it starts making uh, kind of the international arrangements. But if you allow me for 30 seconds uh, to uh, uh, add something to what I said before um, on what I see as a kind of a model for uh, developing into, into the future. Um, uh, I think it is important, first of all, that we work on a big African market and that African various EPAs and other kind of uh, trade arrangements come to an understanding to make as big a market as possible. Secondly, development is only possible if you mix up in a decent and, and controlled manner public money and private money, grant money and commercial money. Uh, there, there, there is no other uh, uh, kind of uh, formula. Uh, and I think the moment has come, and it has been mentioned before, uh, I mean, I'm not a great Africa specialist, but what I read is that Africa is evolving, is, is changing very quickly. Uh, it's no longer just an exporter of raw materials. It's also developing in all kinds of industrial areas, like, for instance, telecommunications, like energy and so on and so forth. Uh, it might well be that a kind of the, the, the I would say, the, the evolution uh, of uh, development in, 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 in at a world scale is that this will move from uh, Africa, uh, sorry, from Asian exporting countries to African exporting countries. This is an opportunity to seize, and you can only seize it if you have a big market and if you know exactly how to best to combine private money and public money. Uh, and I think that uh, what I said before in terms of uh, building up this partnership with African Union and developing these two pillars of the continental free trade area and uh, the uh, Africa-Europe alliance uh, are, in my view, uh, uh, elements for that. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, Sheikh, if you would be around, do you hear me? I think Sheikh is... Hello, Gary. Ah, yeah, Sheikh, your two okay. minutes final observations. Uh, yes, yes, and yes. I hope that this way, this, this uh, time, my, my techniques would be better. Um, just I want to add to uh, some things that I wanted to, to raise uh, earlier uh, on this uh, way for trying to change this partnership. Um, I, want, I think there are a lot of challenges, of course, but both parties, Europe and Africa, are now trying, doing some efforts to be able to change things in the right direction. I was saying earlier that they should change the objectives of this strategy because in the European side, they are still in this kind of short-termistic or opportunistic approach, uh, looking for uh, how to, to, to maintain uh, the market access and so on. But also, I think there are key the first is on the strategy. This partnership is still, for me, a kind of strategy between countries, uh, states now, EU and, uh, and uh, AU, and it is still very institutional. I think on the strategy, they need to introduce new actors such as private sector, civil society, and to take hold the dialogue so that the Africa-Europe partnership would not be only the partnership as uh, of equals, but on states, but would be also a partnership for the people that would be also uh, doing this kind of ownership. The second is on methods. I think we should promote an economic partnership based not only on, on free trade, which were the objectives of EPAs and so on, uh, which was just based on, on unfair agreement, now to kind of uh, development of regional or uh, kind of regional, even international value chains, starting from Africa in order to facilitate or by facilitating the relocation of uh, European companies to, to Africa. Because um, as long as all the good chocolates in the world, which will be made in Netherlands or, or Belgium or Switzerland from ivory and be beans or raw uh, uh, chocolate beans, that would be a problem um, for African countries. But if we try to change that for uh, European investors to come here and to invest on those value chains in order to start processing 
in African countries that would uh, give them more opportunities to be able to 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 deal and to partner as equals because yeah. uh, they would have more opportunities. Lastly, on the on the priorities, we should escape move from the, what I say uh, this uh, um, uh, um, uh, approach dominated by security approach, migration, and so on to a new kind of human security. Talking about uh, security of employment investment on energy, food, agro-food value chains, and so on, and also medicine, because this COVID situation uh, is showing that we need really uh, from Europe perspective to come and to help also building uh, value chains on, on the medicine help and so on. So I think these are some of the uh, uh, propositions that I wanted just to add to what have been said. Thank you very much, uh, Sheikh. Uh, Lidet, very short reaction if you still would like to react, because we have to come to a conclusion of this meeting. Please. We don't hear you. We don't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> I was saying I very much agree with the points that were made before me. Uh, I mean, the main thing for me is, I guess, for um, African countries to leverage the fact that decision making in Africa is consensus based, the fact that the continent often manages to speak with one voice on some thematic areas, they should use that as a leverage uh, to demonstrate to Europe that um, as part of the partnership, that is also one of the things that they could put on the table um, as part of the, the partnership. Um, but having said that, I think we also need to acknowledge that even if the two continents do share a lot of um, interests and objectives when it comes to specific um, uh, questions, uh, the, their interests may not um, always align, uh, making references to uh, what Ambassador Jingyat was saying on reforming the uh, UN Security Council, for example. But when it comes to things like uh, peace and maintaining peace and security, supporting uh, peace support operations in Africa, for example, and getting UN assets contributions to finance peace support operations, for example, I do see um, some possibilities in which the two continents could uh, put their voices um, together. So I, I think the, the main takeaway for me is for African countries to to sell the fact that Africa could speak with one voice on some thematic areas um, as a point of leverage in their negotiation with the EU. Thank you very much, Lidet, and thanks uh, to all uh, participants. Uh, I think we could go on for five more hours. Uh, we covered a lot, but we could uh, go much more into details on a whole range of issues. But let me just uh, formulate a few concluding remarks. First of all, um, I'm very happy that we had such an open debate uh, and we did it on purpose. We did not want to have officials in office taking part in this meeting. We wanted uh, people who did not use what we uh, sometimes say in French, langue de bois. And I think all of you have been very loyal uh, to that principle. You all have been speaking uh, up uh, your mind and your ideas. So that was very, very useful. Um, I would say that our partnership of equal is still a very distant dream. And some of you also have said that it is probably something that is uh, not uh, even reachable and maybe not even desirable. And we should find to uh, we should find the ways to manage certain inequalities that exist. And we should uh, try to uh, build on both sides of the partnership. Uh, uh, and make efforts uh, to reach this. And what I retained from the discussion, what could be done on the European Union side, maybe first of all, making sure that the European Union at a certain moment is able and willing to make concessions on issues that really matter to Africa. And the vaccines was mentioned as one of these uh, areas. It's a great test. And the, the, the trips, uh, the manufacturing capacity uh, uh, building in Africa on vaccines, these are real tests to see whether the European Union is really serious in helping its so-called uh, closest uh, partner and closest neighbor. Um, I think what we also retain was that it doesn't make sense to have pre-cooked ideas and pre-cooked uh, strategies that are being presented to the other side uh, without having a duly discussing uh, taking place with all the different key actors. And in this respect, EPAs were mentioned uh, several times by you. It was not a good process, this EPA process, and we should learn from it. 
Um, a third element on the European side and also on the African side that I retain is that we should build new partnerships with the new generations, uh, the younger generations, the startups, uh, those who will constitute the economic fabric in Africa. We need to reach out much more and much better towards these uh, actors. And then finally, on the European side, I think it was also recommended several times to stop the long-standing fragmentation uh, that exists. Different agreements that compete with each other, with duplication of efforts. Let's do something about it. And we had that opportunity when the post Cotonou negotiations started, but it did not really work out as such. On the African side, I clearly retain that people, uh, participants in the panel said, yes, this is all about power relations. Um, but uh, uh, there could be more efforts made to uh, make clear choices and to strengthen consistent decision making and to sometimes also say no from the African side towards European proposals. Um, and probably very important as well is that African states and African citizens need to make choices as to what type of institutions represent best their interests, including in the multilateral system where Africa is still treated as a paria. So these are some of the, the elements. We also had discussions on the role of aid. Uh, maybe also there we should think of co-responsibility in raising uh, funding and, and funding certain initiatives. Common but differentiated responsibility in terms of funding could also be very helpful. So these are some of the elements on which we should build. And uh, I think we have an opportunity now. Uh, we should avoid not to return to normal after the COVID crisis. Uh, there are a number of opportunities that should be uh, seized now at this very moment. And I would like to thank all of you for these very insightful reflections. We will continue these discussions in the future. And uh, thank you so much for being so frank and open in participating in this discussion. Goodbye to everybody. And thanks a lot also for the very valuable questions. We will take these also with us uh, and make sure that we will uh, build on that for future uh, work. Thank All you best. and bravo. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.